educate yourself. So it starts with you, starts with you. And then after that, it's know your community. I say that because a lot of the women, if not the majority of women statistically who have abortions, are self-identify as Christian. And almost half of them have been to church at least once a month. And that's a horrifying statistic. So when you're, when you're being pro-life, and it's not something that you just put a hat on and go out on the street and counsel. It's something that has to embody your entire life. And there has to be love to it. Christian women who go into these abortion facilities, they more than anyone ought to know what the resources are. And that if they find themselves in that situation, they're not going to receive condemnation and cruelty, but forgiveness and love and help and support. So first, if you want to be pro-life and be effective in your own family and in your own church community, you have to A, speak up about it, but be careful how you do so. It means you don't gossip. If someone is, if you're talking to a friend in high school and they say, oh, did you hear so-and-so got pregnant? You don't condemn her and backbite her because what you're doing there is that you're telling the friend that you're gossiping with that if they get an abortion, they should get an abortion because you're going to talk behind their back and be mean and nasty instead of supportive. People will always, always look at your actions and how you talk about people. When, and when they're in help, when they need help, are they going to come to you if they've seen the way you talk to people behind their backs? So you've got to first educate yourself and know yourself and have a positive presence. You don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be loving because without love, we won't be able to succeed. Step number three is know your community. So you have to look around and is there, are there pro-life organizations available? Do you already have a 40 days for life going on? Can you volunteer there? That's a very easy stepping stone in. You can email the pro-life organizations in your area and say you want to volunteer and they can plug you in and tell you where your efforts are best, might be best needed. And that can be a really easy way in. And if they ignore you, for whatever reason, I don't think it's likely because we could always use more volunteers, but if they do ignore you, or if there is no real pro-life community, then you're, going to have to, then you're going to end up in the mess that I was stuck with. So let's start there. I always was pro-life. And as soon as I came back to Canada, because I grew up overseas, I knew I wanted to get involved. But when I looked around Nova Scotia, I did find some, what should I call it? Sort of like the fossils of a pro-life community. I would go online, I'd look around, and I'd find evidence that once there was strong pro-life sentiment in Nova Scotia, but I couldn't get in touch with anyone. And so the only thing I could do was try and build up the community from scratch. And so I decided to start a 40 Days for Life campaign. That was a bit ambitious and rather terrifying. So my personal advice would be probably start with a life chain because that's one day you have to gather people, not 40 days you constantly have to be calling and organizing and checking up on people. So that's what I did. I decided on a 40 Days for Life campaign. And I do recommend that as getting started if there's not already a strong community around you, because what Free Days does doesn't just highlight that abortion happens in the community. It doesn't just put it in front of, put it in public eye. It also allows you to gather volunteers that you can network with and grow with. So I do highly, highly recommend that because it's a lot harder to do this alone. So how do you do that? How do you get volunteers? Well, Go to areas where there's most, you're most likely to find pro-life people. You can contact Christian organizations on university campuses. You can talk to your parish priest. You can contact various different churches of all denominations and ask if you can speak after their services to promote 40 Days for Life. Now, unfortunately, you might not find a lot of support. There are a lot of people who are afraid so terribly afraid to speak up about abortion, whether they are for it or against it. And even in the church, you'll find people who are for it, which is astonishing in my mind, but it, it does happen. So what do you do? First of all, I would recommend if you don't get anywhere with email, that you try to meet them in person because it is so much harder for people to say no to your face than it is for them to ignore an email or a phone call. 
try to have a physical presence because people don't usually have the guts to say, eh, no, when you're saying, I want to help save lives, could I please speak at mass, after mass? A lot harder if, they're, if you're there in person. And then if, if you have a handful of people you know who are also pro-life, get them to talk to their pastor or their priest. So one thing I did find that worked really well was I did know of one other, only one other pro-life activist in Nova Scotia. And I found out through him through secondhand information. He was at a talk, an inspirational breakfast at my parish that my mom went to. And he, as a closing afterthought, mentioned he was pro-life and that's very important to him. So I tracked down his information and emailed him. And fortunately he got back to me and I said, none of the priests besides my parish priests have responded to me. Since you know them, they will find it harder to say no to someone they actually know. Can you put pressure on them? He said, of course. And so that's how I was able to get him to speak at four other parishes. And that's how I got a lot more volunteers. And then I asked those volunteers to spread it through word of mouth. And then I got more. Word of mouth is more powerful than you might imagine. If we're going to change hearts and minds, it has to be because we spoke to the people around us and we got them involved. Now that sounds very scary. I get that. Standing up in front of, in, standing up to priests, standing up in front of an entire congregation and talking about your pro-life beliefs. It's scary. It is. And there's a lot of, a lot of little fears that can get to you. What if I don't say it properly? What will people think of me? What will they do to me? What will they say to me? What will they say about me? And I did have all those terrible, those insidious little thoughts that scare you. And I would, get, I would get scared. I would pray. I would say, God, am I really, really meant to do this? It's just me and there's no one else and they don't seem supportive and no one seemed to want this. And they're all, and even the people I know who are pro-life, who used to be activists, they came up to me and they'd say, honey, there's no point. They've won. Abortion's here. It's going to stay. Why bother? And it always comes down to the why bother? Why bother? Why bother? Why? Why? Because children are being killed. They're being dismembered. They're being torn apart in their mother's wombs. They're having their limbs ripped off and their skulls crushed. And I knew that. I knew that. And I knew by extension, families were being torn apart and women were suffering and men had lost fatherhood and it was affecting generations, affecting everything. It's a poison on society. And I knew that. And so I had to do it because the alternative, the alternative was to look in the mirror and see a coward, see someone who turned a blind eye to injustice and allowed it to continue. I took some inspiration from a story my father told me. He was bullied significantly when he was in middle school. He was beaten up every day at the bus stop. And I remember he told me once that it wasn't actually getting beat up that was the worst part. It was the fact that the bus driver and an entire bus load of students on the bus watched it happen and did nothing. And he said, if there had just been those three guys who were beating the crap out of me, I could have said, well, it's just them and they're awful, horrible people. But because everyone watching did not stand up, it made me think that I was the bad one, that I deserved it somehow. Never, ever allow yourself to be deluded that just because you're not the one perpetrating the crime, you bear no responsibility. The upholder is just as bad as the thief. And so that's why I did it. And we need to remember that because it will get hard. There will be people who don't like it. And people have said to me, you must be so brave. I wish I was brave like you. I'm like, don't you get scared? Like, yeah, yes, I do. It's like, it's like building muscle. The first time I ever held a sign, I realized, gosh, I'm branding myself. My face is out in public. There's a sign here. People are going to take pictures. They're going to know. And I was scared. And there weren't enough volunteers to cover all the hours of more than one, all the hours. And so I tried to fill as many as I could. And often that meant being by myself with a sign. 
And I would get so scared that I would close my eyes because I didn't want to see the people who were staring malevolently at me. And I would stay there and I would remind myself why I was here, why I was here, because inside the hospital, children were being murdered. And that meant I could not ignore it. It does not take an incredible, special person to go, to go and do that. It takes one person who knows that it's wrong and who, and who stands out there and does it. And then of course, there's that last niggling thought, which is, well, what use am I? I'm only one person. What can one person even do? But first of all, that one person is better than nothing. Maybe you're the only person out there, but that day someone walks in to get an abortion and sees you and changes your mind, changes their mind, and they don't get that abortion. And one person can be inspiring. And it can also be shaming, and there's a bit of both. But there are a lot of people who don't have the courage to do it alone, but they will if they're in a group. But in order to get a group started, one person has to step forward. And it may be in your community, if you're in a community like mine that was dying, it needs to be you. And so what I found was that if one person goes forward, there are people who will follow. One of the best speeches I gave that resulted in the highest number of volunteers was on, my, on one of the days I actually felt at my lowest, where I got gotten almost no volunteers and I went up and I spoke and I concluded with, and if no one, if no one volunteers, then I will stand alone. And I must have sounded as somber as I felt because after that people were volunteering and I realized that, I, that, that my, me being a 21 year old girl speaking up and saying, I will do this alone if you won't stand up for what you believe in was an indictment on them. It does matter because one person can start a march. It takes a pebble to start an avalanche. So I started off slow. And it turned out that in my parish, the president of Campaign Life Coalition Nova Scotia also was attending. And as he said that there, that they had just lost a very important member of their team. And because everyone was in the, in the pro-life group in Nova Scotia was aging, that was why I'd found no evidence of their work because they didn't have anyone young to carry the banner forward. And so he asked me if I would be willing to become the coordinator. And I said, yes, of course. And so with their resources, I was finally able to grow what I thought would only be 10 volunteers in 40 Days for Life to 100. 100. And we were able to maintain a decent prayer vigil outside of the hospital. And of course, this was very upsetting to the abortion supporters. Very upsetting. Because they thought no pro-life spirit in Nova Scotia was dead. 40 Days for Life had trickled out. It hadn't happened in six years. There was no sign of any pro-life activism besides maybe five or 10 people in a small march for life. They thought they'd won. They thought they'd won. But instead, I said, no, I won't watch this happen. I won't watch this happen. And so I revitalized it by just being this lone little voice saying, please join me to stand up against injustice. And then they petitioned for bubble zone laws, which they got, they passed it through in eight days. Eight days, first reading, second reading, third reading, royal assent. They did it so quickly. And I did go to the committee on law amendments and I did speak up but how this was unconstitutional. And of course I did not listen. But what I took away from it was that one, the efforts of one person and bring together a team that will scare abortion supporters enough that they will try to silence us. And I will not be silent. And, be, and that was what started, that was what started the 40 Days for Life again in Halifax, and that's what's going to continue it. And if we keep doing that, if we change enough hearts and minds, then we can get abortion abolished in Canada 
because people will value the pro-life vote and they will choose to vote that way. The only way to do it is if everyone who knows what abortion is and knows that it is evil chooses to embody that belief and put their money where their mouth is. So that's my challenge to all of you. If you are not involved in the pro-life movement, do it. It's very fulfilling and it's terrifying as it can be. There's far more joy to be had. And between you and I, between you and me, well, I might have started off closing my eyes because I was scared to see what people were thinking or saying or doing or looking at me. I now am no longer afraid holding those signs because I've got experience now. And I've learned that there is a great joy in being there to, to stand for life.